My mind is stayed on him because his mind was stayed on me. Well, how I know his mind was stayed on me. That's why he would not come down from the cross. He could have came down. He should have came down. But his love was so deep. His love was so genuine. His love kept him up on that cross. And what nails in his hands. I was on his heart. My name was on his heart. Come on, everybody, put your hands together. It's got to get better. All over the world, listen to these words. People come. People come. People go. People go. Your life has been, Your life has been out, of control. out of control. You're confused. You're confused. But don't worry. Don't worry your soul. It will get better. It's got to get better. Committed love, love that was sacrifice, love where there are no limits to what our Lord and Savior was willing to do, that he might reconcile us to be back into relationship with him. What a mighty God we serve. We th praise the Lord for you, Elder Gerald Norwood. Amen. And I think... Uh, Gerald Miller with a G for uh, introducing us uh, to Gerald with a J. Amen. So we appreciate that. If you have your Bibles um, or you got your iPads, iPhones, or you're waiting on the screen, we'll be in the great book of Acts. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. Let's say praise the Lord for our musicians. Amen. Amen. I love it. I see Curtis over in that corner. He'll be getting down. Amen. Drum in the house. And I got my brother Jarrell. He kind of sharp today. I say, man, what you got going on today, man? You know, he turned 21. He just stepped it up a little bit there. You know, he ain't baby Jarrell no more growing up. Amen. So it's just a blessing to have young people in the church. Amen. Amen. And I was blessed this past Monday to uh, go and have uh, dinner with some of our uh, young adults and just to hear and see what they're doing. Um, it's just a true blessing to us and gives us all hope. Amen. Amen. That there's another generation that's coming behind. Very familiar passage, one that we all love, one that all gives us hope. Uh, in Acts chapter 2, verse number 1 through 8. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem devout men from every nation under heaven, and when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in their own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galatians? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? And all of God's people said, and the subject matter is just amazing on how God kind of lines you up with what's to come. Amen. Amen. Because I sent out my sermon on uh, Sunday nights and Monday, not knowing what was going to happen on throughout the week and on yesterday. But I just thank God that we kind of lined up today. Amen? Amen. So tell your neighbor, neighbor, it's time, it's time to, come to come together. If there's ever a time oh that that message needs to go forth. Is right here, right now. You see, you can survive alone, but you will thrive together. You can be great alone, but you can be extraordinary together. You can compete alone, but you can dominate together. You can get there alone, but you can go beyond together. 
You can excel alone, but you can become unstoppable together. Somebody say together. together. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9 through 12 gives us a little motivation on the benefits and blessings of being together. It says two are better off than one because together they can work more effectively. Yes. If one of them falls down, the other can do what? Help them up. But if someone is alone and falls, it's just what? Too bad because there's no one there to help them. If it's cold, two men, two, not two men, two, two can sleep together and stay warm. But how can you keep warm by yourself? Two men can resist an attack that would defeat one man alone. A rope of three cords is hard to break. We are better together than we are alone. Say good catch, Pastor. Good catch. <laughs> Here in our text this morning, we are confronted with the disciples who are coming together not to compromise their faith, not to complain about their faith, not to even challenge or doubt anything about their faith, but they're coming to be changed by the power from the spirit of Jesus Christ. Christ had told them to wait, stay in Jerusalem, and you will receive power as you will be filled with his Holy Spirit. This moment of coming together will forever change the disciples and change humanity to grow in their faith together, which is a gift to one another. We cannot be who God calls us to be without one another. We have to come together if we want to get there. If we never come together, we will never get to where God wants us to be as a community yes. and our ability to communicate, to collaborate, and to commit to creating a culture and an environment where Christ is truly the center and everybody wins and not just a special group. Yes. Amen. Amen. The disciples were in a position of power on the day of Pentecost. For the first century Jew, Pentecost was the 50th day after Passover. It was an agricultural festival. It was the day when farmers brought the first sheaf of wheat from the crops and offered it to God, partly as a sign of gratitude. You see, today, we take food for granted, right? We go into Mariano's, we go into Jewel's, we just see food everywhere. Well, back then in agriculture, in society, where they totally depend upon, God, if you don't raise it, we're not going to eat. And so on, on the, the Pentecost, they came and showed their gratitude for the first sheaf as a sign of their gratitude and partly as a prayer that all the rest of their crops will be safely gathered in as well. But for the Jew, neither Passover nor Pentecost was simply about agricultural festivals. These festivals awakening the echoes of the great story which dominated their memories of the Jewish people. The story of the exodus from Egypt, when God had fulfilled his promises to Abraham of rescuing his children from being in bondage. Passover was a time when the lambs were sacrificed and the Israelites were saved from the death angel who was slay the firstborn of the Egyptians. Off went the Israelites that very night and they passed through the Red Sea to Sinai. But then 50 days after Passover, they named, they came to Mount Sinai where Moses received the law. Somebody say, well, how is this all fitting in? When we look closely at the way that some Jews told the story of giving of the law on Mount Sinai, we can see some parallels there, too. When the Israelites arrived at Mount Sinai, Moses went up, somebody say up, up to the mountain, and then he came down with the law. Well, here Jesus has gone up into heaven into ascension. And so Luke wants us to understand he is now coming down again, not with a written law carved on tablets of stone, but with the dynamic energy of the law that's designed to be written on the human hearts so that we're no longer living with divided hearts. 
because we now have his heart. Somebody say his heart. His heart. It was at Pentecost that God was using those who were on the outside of power to receive his power to do as at and slogan used to say, reach out and touch someone with his power and with his love and with his grace. That's why the church exists. It doesn't exist to spread gossip and jealousy and bitterness and all of those things that the world do. We exist to spread, somebody say love. love. Somebody say kindness. kindness. Somebody say joy. joy. Somebody say forgiveness. forgiveness. Somebody say compassion. compassion. That's why we exist as a church. That's the only thing should be coming up out of life church or any other church that's opened up in the name of Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen? You see, before there was a social media that attempts to bring people together, to reunite people, to reconnect people, to restart friendships and relationships from Facebook to Snapchat. Uh, Snapchat. And my son just told me, uh, you see, the young folks, as soon as they find out that the parents on that uh, social media, they got another one. So I said, you got to tell me that next one, young man. But there was... Before all this social media trying to bring us together, there was Pentecost bringing people together to be empowered with the power of love, forgiveness, compassion, kindness, and long suffering. The difference between social media and Pentecost is that social media brings you together to entertain you. But Pentecost brings you together, somebody say, to empower you. To live and to love like Christ. If we're not living and not loving like Christ, then we must ask ourselves, am I still filled with that Jack Daniels of vodka? Because we are not supposed to be acting like we used to act like when we was in a dating game or Godfather or Chick Ricks or whatever club you used to go to. We're supposed to act like we've been filled with God's holy, loving, kind, long-suffering, awesome love that would not come down from the cross. When you got the love of God, you don't give up on your loved ones. When you got the love of God, you don't go off on your loved ones. When you got the love of God, you go and you hug your loved ones, pull your loved ones up if they're down, have Five you up when they're doing good. Can I get an amen? He didn't know he was going to be a part of my props today. That's what happens when you sit up front, amen? But there should be a difference. We as Christians are not called to be entertainers. We are called to empower the world and your communities with this message that Jesus loves. And how can I prove that he loves? By how I love them through my behavior. Can I get an amen? amen. Social media Pentecost bringing us together. We love to come together to celebrate. We love to come together. Everybody here probably we went to a family union this year. Amen. We come together for weddings, no, birthdays, anniversaries, promotions, class reunions, new homes. We come together to celebrate the life of a loved one who's gone and made their transition into heaven. We come together to not only celebrate, but we come together to confront the injustices that are in our community and our country that prevent progressive change for humanity. We had to come together to fight past injustices. Our great ancestors had to come together to overcome slavery. Women had to come together to advance their rights in the home and in the community and the corporate world. Women had to come together and let the world know that they can do more than just birth a baby. That they can birth the baby, bake the chicken, bring home the bacon, and go to work and be just like the man. Can I get an amen? Sister, y'all too quiet on that. Amen. But see, y'all quiet because you might not have been a part of the struggle. 
Somebody else went before you and broke open the doors so that you can have the rights, so you can have that prospering business over in LaGrange, Sister Talita, amen? So Sister Joyce could be rising up that ladder at Blue Cross Blue Shield, amen? Somebody was a trailblazer. Somebody paid a price. We had to come together to end the Jim Crow laws in the South. We had to come together to defend and demand our equal and our civil rights in the 60s and 70s. We had to come together in unison 100 percent to elect the first African-American president. We had to come together because if we don't come together, then we cannot be who God wants us to be. When we come together, there is nothing that we can cannot accomplish in life. If we're not achieving it, that's because we're not coming together to achieve it. But not only do we have past injustices, we still have present injustices. That's why we continue to have the senseless black on black crime in our communities, because we have not come together to eliminate it. We've come together to protest it, but we've not come together to eliminate it. And it's not going to end by somebody on the outside of our community doing it. It's not going to end until we as a body come together. This morning as I speak to you, if there's ever time for the world that needs for us to come together, the governor of Virginia will say, come right now. He had to call the state of emergency, call us all off guard because there was a hate crime, hate march, the unity rights in Charleston, Virginia, trying to speak up and speak out on yesterday. Here it is, 2017, and you still have hate in America. But tell your neighbor, not so, because hate anywhere is hate everywhere. And so we all must come together and confront it, challenge it, and cease it from continuing in our communities. America and North Korea must come together and stop the trash talk of fiery and fury locked and loaded on Twitter to get to the table and find a common ground so that lives are saved and are not sacrificed over the pride of the ego of who's the strongest and who's the toughest. You see, the strongest of the toughest is not defined by how much power you have. It's not defined it just because I can go in L.A. Fitness and bench up a couple of dumbbells. That's not how it's really defined. The strongest and toughest is defined by those who are able to remain calm, cool, and collective. Yes. Who are under control during times of crisis. That's true strength. Let me show you true strength. True strength is when... You're in a disagreement, but you're able to hold your tongue. That's true strength. True strength when you know you're right and they're talking about you like I don't know what. But you're able to stay up under control. True strength is not when you're the loudest or the craziest or the cruelest. Anybody can act out of control with that. But true strength. It's maintaining, staying on top of your emotions, rather your emotions staying on top of you. Not only do the White House need to be up under control and come together, but our families need to come back together. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Our families need to come back together from bickering and blaming and arguing and fighting, all breaking up over nothing. Nobody wins when there is division. Nobody wins when there is separation. Nobody wins when there is divorce. Everybody loses. If we want a better family, then we must be willing to do whatever it's necessary to bring that family back together. Bring it back together so we're blessing one another, comforting one another, encouraging one another, supporting one another. God does not want us divided over our differences. He wants us to be able to embrace our differences. Think about it. We get frustrated with God's creation because they're different. But we forget God made them that way. And if God made them that way, you ain't going to change them. The challenge becomes, can you be able to see the value in their differences? What I learned in my own marriage, my own relationship, is God give us differences to help develop us in our own deficiencies. 
Where I'm weak, she's strong. Where she's weak, I'm strong. But if I look at her differences as coming against me, I will never be able to embrace them so they could be a blessing to me. Tell your neighbor, Lord, your guards. So you can let your blessings come through. You never know how God is trying to speak to you and speak through somebody else's, through their differences. But when we stuck on it's got to be my way or the highway, you have just denied and forfeited God's blessings coming to you. My football coach used to tell us all the time, if you're smart enough to listen, a bum on the street can save your life. But when you think you know everything, you can die and God is sending help through somebody out there on the street. Can I get an amen? amen? You see, the temperature of the house is not caused by those on the outside, but it's caused by those who are unwilling to be held accountable for how they contribute to the chaos in your crib. Amen. Instead of pointing the fingers at what somebody else has or has not done, I got a little solution for everybody today. Take your cell phones up and imagine your cell phone is your mirror. And so before you start blaming somebody in your house, tell your neighbor, look in the mirror. And see what deficiencies you have on this eye, this eye behind here. You see, I've learned in life and growing nine times out of ten in our difficulties is not the other individual. But it's easy for me to shift them over to that person. But when I'm able to reflect and look in the mirror, I begin to d discover it's me. I'm the issue. Oh God. <laughs> then I got to go apologize. I'm sorry. <laughs> but when we are able to correct the one where you have the greatest opportunity to change, and the person that you have the greatest opportunity to change, Tell your neighbor, it's not your spouse. It's not your spouse. <laughs> because if you're in the business of trying to change your spouse or change somebody else, I can tell you right now, that's a losing fight. All right. All right. So change the one that you have the greatest opportunity to change. Somebody say, who's that? Me, myself, and I? Yes. Yes. Let's stop dividing the family. Let's start uniting the family. Tell your neighbor, it's time to come together. Or as Sister Sledge once said, we are family. I got all my brothers and sisters with me. Let's come together. The genesis of division is coming to grips that it's all because that we have divided hearts. And God wants us to have a whole heart. The Bible tells us to love the Lord thy God with all our heart, all our soul, and all our minds. He says, don't give me part of your heart. Give me what? All of your heart. With divided hearts, we give part-time praise expecting a full-time blessing. If we're not getting what we're expecting, then we need to examine what we're giving. How can we give God a pure praise with a polluted mind on everything but the Lord? God wants a pure heart with a pure praise that's not polluted. He wants a heart that is sincere and genuine. As Psalms 51 tells us, create in me a clean heart, renew in me a steadfast spirit. God wants us to have, somebody say, a whole heart, a, whole heart. a pure heart, a, a cleansed heart. heart. Somebody say, so Pastor Green, how do we get back together. I got three simple statements for you. Tell your neighbor, step number one, step number one. Get, rid of get rid of your pride. Your pride. Come on, Pastor. Come on. Stop thinking more of yourself than you ought to. Stop taking the elevator to some place you don't belong. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before fall. Proverbs tells us pride brings a person low, but the lowly in spirits gains honor. Yes. Wherever there's pride, pride prevents us from reconciling individuals, and it causes division everywhere. 
It was pride that got Lucifer kicked out of heaven, thinking he could usurp God. It was pride that got Adam and Eve evicted out of the Garden of Eden from being disobedient, from not eating, eating from the tree of life. It was pride that distorted Saul's perspective of David and looked at him as his enemy rather than God's anointed. It was pride that the older brothers of Joseph couldn't stomach the fact that one day they may have to bow down to him. And so they sold him into slavery. It was pride that called the people to reject God's commandment in Genesis 9 and 1 when he told them to go and to populate the land. What did they do? God, we have our own agenda. We'll build our own tower. God says, not so. But it was pride where God confused their language at Babel. It was pride that God had to move these individuals from a place of destruction. It was pride at Babel. But look what happens in Jerusalem. Because in Babel, instead of obeying God, they disobey God. And their language was confused. But here in Jerusalem, when the disciples obeyed Christ and humbled themselves and they waited for Christ, mm-hmm. instead of there being pride of life, there was humility of life. Yes, yes. At Babel, they were trying to make themselves great. But at Jerusalem, God was making them great. At Babel, they were trying to protect their future. But at Jerusalem, God was empowering them for their future. At Babel, God confused their language, but at Jerusalem, God gave them clarity of speech as everyone that was witnessing from all over the place. They were speaking in other tongues, but not the tongues that you and I speak in today. You see, today we try to repeat Pentecost. And we start speaking in other languages, but at this Pentecost, the language they were speaking, people were able to do what? Understand it. Because they said, how is it that these are Galatians and they're speaking in our language? Babel, there was confusion. At Jerusalem, there was what? Clarity. What allowed for this opportunity? It was the spirit of obedience to the Lord's command to wait in Jerusalem. They did not have any idea how they would receive power. They just took Jesus at his word. They did not question his word. They did not doubt his word. They believed his word and waited in prayer. You see, pride calls us to have disbelief, disobedience, and experience disappointment in life. But here in Acts, God is fulfilling his promise to make Abraham's name great in spite of the disobedience at Babel. God fulfills his promise at Jerusalem through his disciples' obedience. Obedience makes you available for God's opportunities. Disobedience disqualifies you for experiencing display of God's power. If we want to come together, we must tell your neighbor, get rid of the pride. Get rid of the pride. Because here at Pentecost, In Acts, we see God bringing them back together to reunite them, to reset them, and to restart them for accomplishing his purpose of continuing the message of Jesus Christ. But not only must you get rid of your past, get rid of your pride, tell your neighbor, you got to get over your past. You got to get over your past in order to go beyond your past. You see, as long as you are hanging on to yesterday's mistakes, yesterday's pains, yesterday's misfortunes, yesterday's frustrations, you will never be able to take hold of what today and tomorrow can bring into your life. Paul said, one thing I do, forgetting those things behind, that I can reach forward to those things ahead. 
Passover was a time when the lambs were sacrificed and the Israelites were saved. And in the New Testament, Jesus Christ becomes our lamb. He becomes our sacrifice. And the question I must ask ourselves is that if God can pass over our sins, why do we sometimes find ourselves to keep dipping and dabbing in old sins that God has delivered us from? Not only do we keep dipping and dabbing, but why do we keep bringing up other people's sins back in their face? Tell your neighbor, it's time to move forward. Passover is all about God's grace, God's favor. If God can give you grace to pass over your sins, then why are you not giving grace to somebody else to pass over their mistakes? If God has given you favor to promote you in that corporation, then why are you not reaching down and reaching back to help promote somebody else? If God has given you grace to forgive you for all of your misgivings, then why can't you have the patience to forgive other people? Don't forget from where God has delivered you from. Don't forget for how far God has brought you. You see, a lot of times we have a memory lapse. We forget from whence we have come. And we expect other people just to change overnight when we didn't change overnight. I ain't always been this way. It took her 18 years to get me like this. And I'm still working process. But what we expect, we must be willing to give to one another. How would a people ever be attracted to church if we are not extending grace and extending love and extending humility to other people? Yes, yes. I don't wish wrong on you, but when wrong is done to you in the workplace or in the community, that's your time to shine. Yes. When it comes your way, when you get blamed, God gets you on display. How would they know that you are able to take something if you never had to take something? This gives you another perspective. When you're going through, you're going through because God has a purpose for you. The Bible tells us that what all things work together for the good of those who love him, who are called to what? According to his purpose. But how is God going to bring others to us if they can't see him through us? So tell your neighbor, get rid of the pride. Get over your past so you can get started with a new way of life. You see, Pentecost, the 50th day, yes, it's about first fruits, but it's also about God giving his redeemed people a new way of life. A new way of life that now you don't have to operate from a God who is distant from you. Now you don't have to operate through works. Now you don't have to operate according to the law. Now you're going to operate because you have everything you need on the inside of you. All right. Now you have God Almighty living deep down on the inside of you. And because you have this new power, now guess what? I can't have that same excuse. I can't have the same excuse excuse that I couldn't help myself. Yes, you could help yourself. You just didn't want to help yourself. I got it on that one. (laughs) All right. No longer the excuse. I had good intentions. Good intentions to get you killed. Good intentions to get you fired. Tell your neighbor, good intentions get you nowhere. We have to use and be responsible for what God has given us. The Bible tells us to do what? Hide his word in our heart that we might not sin against him. When we are sinning, that means I'm not full of his word. Because God's word is better than a Z-pack of the antibiotic. 
God's word is better than penicillin. God's word is better than amoxicillin. God's word is better than anything that a scientist could ever come up for you. You see, I get a little sneeze, I go running for that z pack to fight it off. But God's word, tell your neighbor, it works. It works. Because it's efficacious. And it has the power to change us. It's about this new way of life that we are directed by God's Holy Spirit. This new way of life where we meditate. We're not meditating on what's coming on power tonight. We're meditating on the power that's in his word. His word that will sanctify us. His word that will change us. His word that will cleanse us. His word that will give us hope. His word that will do what nothing else can do for us. A new way of life that we are the light of the world and not darkness of the world. A new way of life that we are the headlights and not the taillights. The new way of life that we are overcomers and not defeated. The new way of life that we may be cast down but tell your neighbor we get back up. The new way of life that yes I may have fell down yesterday. Yes I may have been like Peter who denied the Lord before he had the Holy Spirit but after he had the Holy Spirit, Peter was willing to die for Christ. A new way of life. I might have been like the Apostle Paul where I was persecuting Christ. But now that I have God's Holy Spirit, I'm willing to get persecuted for the church. A new way of life. Well, guess what? When people see you, they're going to say you look strange. Something is different about you. What happened to you? Where you been, young man? A new way of life that you're going to be doing strange things. They're going to say, what are you doing? You are not judging each other to death, but you're restoring each other back to life. You're not being critical of each other, but you're being compassionate to one another. You're not being jealous to one another, but you're helping one another. We're not falling to the traps of the enemy. We're avoiding the traps of the enemy. We're not losing our mind. We're giving our mind to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My mind is stayed on him because his mind was stayed on me. Well, how I know his mind was stayed on me, that's why. He would not come down from the cross. He could have came down. He should have came down. But his love was so deep. His love was so genuine. His love kept him up on that cross. It wasn't nails in his hands. I was on his heart. My name was on his heart. Gerald's name was on his heart. Rose's name was on his heart. Sister Miller's name was on his heart. Your name was on his heart. He hung you up there. He hung high. He stretched wide. He bent down. But he would not get up because his love to bring you and I together that we will be with our Heavenly Father. Never again to be separated from him. That's why I'm excited about him. That's why I want to teach about him. I know I'm saved. I know I'm going to heaven. I know one day I'm going to be in his presence. I know one day I'm going to look just like him. I'm not going to have. It ain't going to matter that I'm five two no more. It ain't going to matter if I'm black or white. It ain't going to matter if I'm 146 pounds. Now it's 150 pounds. It ain't going to matter no more what my social economic status means. It's not going to matter, Mike Brock, that I'm a capper. It's not going to matter what neighborhood I live in. What's going to matter, Brother Jarrell? What's going to matter is I got the blood that washes me. The blood that cleanses me. The blood that gives me new strength. The blood. The blood. The blood of Christ. What brings us together? Somebody say, what brings us together? Tell your neighbor, the blood. Not white blood. Not black blood. Not Jewish blood. Not Catholic blood. But the blood of Jesus Christ. The righteous blood. The 
forgiving blood, the everlasting blood, is that blood that brings us together. Let's stand on our feet. Give me a solo something. I need something, amen. Whatever you got in your heart. His blood still works, and I'm glad to report that he never lost its power. Yes, it works. I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. His blood still works. And I'm glad to report that it never lost its power. Oh, yes, it works. I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Oh, oh, oh the blood. Oh!